Um, so I thought I, I'd give it a shot here. And there's some different things about how we go about doing, doing molds. First of all, if you're a physician and you're trying to order a culture, this is, this is kind of the menu that you get from our lab. Uh, if, you, if you want to do a bacterial culture, there's this whole long list. You know, I've listed a bunch of them there, the top ones there, but there's a whole bunch of different types of cultures. So you, you, you base it what you order based on uh, where you're taking the specimen from. You know, what type of specimen is it? Uh, and then we have different process for working it up based upon the body site. But when you get over here to the right side, when you get to acid fast bacilli or fungi, it's it's different. We don't separate them out based upon the type of specimen it is. Um, now, you might, for example, with acid fast bacilli, there might be some rapidly growing mycobacteria that will grow on regular bacterial cultures. We, we see that every now and then. We get a mycobacterium fortuitum every now and then. On, on a bacterial culture. Um, but basically, a physician's got to know this is an infection that looks like it might be an acid vas bacillus infection, uh, and then order the AFB culture or the AFB blood culture to do that. Uh, same process as well. Um, the regular bacterial cultures will almost always grow a yeast. If, if you've got a Canada albicans or glabrata or morris, uh, that's going to grow on a routine bacterial culture. You don't need a fungal culture for that. So a physician's got to know, I'm thinking this patient may have an infection caused by a mold. Uh, and because of that, we're going to order a fungal culture or we're going to order a fungal blood culture. So the question then comes, how do you know? What are the hints that tells you that somebody's got a mold infection? And, and there's a bunch of things. I've listed the, the biggies here. And, and I'll go ahead and point out that really the main ones on this list are going to be right up here on the top left. Uh, this is the way I look at molds. Um, molds really are, are fairly, fairly low virulence organisms. They are bugs that live out in the soil and dirt and dust. Uh, they're not really very virulent when it comes to infecting a human. So basically, a patient has to have some form of compromise. I mean, even if you start talking about athlete's foot, you've got a little bit of a compromise there in that you've been wearing the same sweaty shoes for a long time, and the skin's gotten moist, so it's easier for the bugs to get in. And we can think about uh, dimorphic organisms. You, you can look at it and say, well, a totally healthy person can get an, a uh, histoplasma infection. Uh, and that's true, but real histoplasma disease uh, is going to be largely in people who have some compromise. So it's it's a big diagnostic stewardship question because you have to kind of say this is a situation where uh, the the conditions are right for a mold infection, and we're only going to order those mold cultures uh, when that's the case. Um, now, I do understand. I I'll tell you this. Most of the fungal cultures we get, I would imagine, are in people who really are not at very high risk uh, for mold infection. But we get these fungal cultures anyway. And I I'm not too worried about that for most part because, you know, I understand there's, there's specimens that are uh, collected in surgery or bronchoscopy, these difficult to order, uh, difficult to collect specimens. Uh, we get a lot of fungal cultures that are requested on those simply because while you've got it, you you check for everything. But molds are everywhere. Like I said, they live out in the environment. This little kid is having a great time playing the leaves. And at the same time, he's sucking in all kinds of mold spores. Uh, they're all over the place there. Uh, these people look like they're really happy cleaning up their, their dining room. Uh, but there's going to be dirt uh, and molds uh, around there as well. In fact, I'm going to show you some plates here, and you have to promise that you will not tell my wife that I showed you these plates. Um, but this is from a couple of weeks ago. This one on the right uh, is the dust on top of our water heater. Now, true, that's in the basement, and we don't normally go sniffing around our water heater. But just goes to show you, there's several different molds here, some, some bacteria, a very cool little orange colony over here. I have no idea what that is, um, but they're in there in our home. This one on the left, this is our bedroom carpet. I just took a plate and smushed it down in the carpet. Uh, got at least three or four different molds here. Uh, and this really cool little bug right here that's, that's 
not getting along with this one. There's some antagonism going on there. I should have isolated this bug to see if it's producing some kind of new antifungal agent. I could have made a mint off it. Uh, but just goes to show you, even though if you have a relatively clean house, uh, there are molds there. there. There are mold spores around and, and you will be exposed to them. We've talked a lot over the past uh, few years now uh, about bacterial cultures. And, and this is kind of the, the high tech stuff that we have these days. This is how we do a bacterial culture. We have automated plate streakers. We have automated instrumentation and imaging of plates. We take those plates and we put those colonies on a moldy, which tells us what the ID is right off the bat. And then we take it and we put it on an automated susceptibility instrument. So this has all changed a lot over the past few years. Um, uh, certainly we don't do it like we did uh, 10 years ago. Um, this is how we do a fungal culture in 2024. Uh, and you know, I could have been giving this presentation 50 years ago and be telling you the exact same. Nothing has changed uh, in decades on how we do a fungal culture. It's a very manual, hands-on, non-automated process. So let me give you some stuff about it. This is the media we use, and I don't, I don't care. You don't need to memorize what media we use. That's not important. I just want to point out that it is different stuff that we use. We use things that are going to encourage the growth of uh, molds uh, and inhibit the growth of bacteria. We even put some antibiotics in some of this stuff. Um, uh, chloramphenicol to kill off pretty much all the bacteria and cyclohexamid. Some moles are resistant, some moles are susceptible. Uh, whether it grows on that medium is, is a very important clue for us. So different media that are, that are not used for anything else. Uh, another difference from bacterial culture is the incubation. Uh, they like cooler temperatures. These, like I said, these are bugs that live out in the environment. So they like room temperature. Uh, 37 degrees is not their happiest place. Uh, so they're going to grow at cooler temperatures than the, uh, than the bacteria do. They're all aerobes. They like to have air. They, they don't grow in anaerobic conditions. Uh, and they grow slowly. Uh, that is why we typically will not get a mold growing on a routine bacterial culture. If you suspect the mold, you need to order the fungal culture, not the routine culture. Um, we may get one pop up every now and then, but that's the exception, not the rule. Uh, so these go for four weeks. All these plates are going to be in this incubator for four weeks uh, before we toss them out and call it negative. Uh, when dealing with molds, uh, safety is also an issue. We do not want our staff being exposed to mold spores, uh, one because of infection, but also because of allergies. Uh, we don't want our lab being exposed to a lot of mold spores. Uh, it's, it's not unheard of for laboratories to get heavily contaminated with mold spores. Uh, and then it's it's ruined. You can't grow anything in that lab anymore uh, because the, the molds are all, always contaminating your plates. So everything is shrink sealed. It's kind of hard to see with this picture here, but these plates are all sealed up. So you can top, drop the plate. The lid's not going to come off. Uh, any mold growth is going to be safely contained inside. Uh, we do that with all of our fungal cultures. As soon as they're streaked out, they're sealed. Uh, if we happen to get a mold growing on a bacterial culture, that plate immediately gets shrink sealed so that we uh, aren't exposed to it. And everything, everything that is done working with those cultures is done inside a safety cabinet so that those spores cannot come out um, and uh, in, infect the person or the environment. Now, just like 50 years ago, to, to identify molds, we rely very heavily on two important instruments, uh, eyeballs and brains. Uh, it, it really is a process of a person looking at it, thinking about it, consulting with textbooks and pictures and figuring out what that mold is. So let me give you some examples here uh, uh, of how this works. Uh, first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna look at the colony. Now, don't don't get too crazy here. I'm not going. There's not going to be a pop quiz here. Uh, I just want to show you. Here's some of the things that the person looking at this has to kind of take into account. 
how long does it take to grow? Some of them grow fairly quickly. You know, some of them you'll see colonies coming up in two or three days. Some of them may take two or three weeks before they grow. Which of those media that we streaked out is it going to grow on? Uh, some of them like some better than others. Uh, particularly important, did it grow on that medium containing cyclohexamid? That, that's a big sign for us about what it might be. And then you're going to look at that colony and try to figure out who it is based upon the look of that colony. This one here uh, is a very cottony texture. If you could hold the plate on its side, it's got lots of frizz sticking up. Um, you know, good, good texture, be able to look at that and tell right off the bat that that's probably going to be some form of a zygomycete, a rhizopus or a mucor or something like that. Um, this one here, you know, you're looking at the texture. This is a little bit more granular texture. It's nice and pretty, kind of a dark green, a blue-green color with a white apron, this is called, around the outside. You know, you'd be thinking something like a penicillium or an aspergillus uh, fumigatus on that one. Um, this one here is one of my favorites, uh, actually. You look at the texture on this one. This one is now called a velvety texture. Uh, it's called varicose topography. It's like you're looking down... Uh, on a mountain range, you know, with all kinds of little bumps and all over it. Uh, this bug here, if we saw that, we would be thinking almost certainly uh, some sort of environmental contaminant. This is a cladosporium, a very, very common environmental contaminant uh, that rarely causes disease, at least rarely causes disease in the United States. Uh, and this is a terrible picture here, kind of out of focus, but kind of a small white fuzzy. There's a lot of moles that are small white fuzzy. Uh, and small white fuzzy doesn't tell you a whole lot. Uh, it could be nothing important, uh, or in this case, it could be a histoplasma, something like that. So once we got it off the, the plate, then we have to look at it microscopically. And forgive the questions, I'm throwing a whole lot of terms out here that I don't expect anybody to really pay attention to what these terms mean. Uh, I'm just trying to you know, point out here that there's, there's a lot of things that you can get microscopically that we're kind of looking for. So for example, you can look at this. This is really, really it's cool. I mean, this is the fun part of mycology is, is seeing these structures under the microscope and kind of saying, oh, well, you know, let's figure this out. Um, this one here is a nice, cool bug. You can see there's these hyphae uh, the filaments here that kind of fold over on themselves. There's no septa in here. He's got these roots down here at the bottom. Uh, that's a pretty nice uh, rhizopus species. This guy here, you know, they come up, they swell up at the end here, and then have all these chains of, of canidia, spores are called canidia for molds. Uh, that's an aspergillus fumigatus right there. This is one of our favorites. Everybody loves a good curvularia. Uh, little crescent rolls. Uh, uh, it, it's you know it's just a cool. It's got some character. So we we all like a good curvularia. We we get that fairly frequently. Probably the number one place that we get that from uh, is going to be eye infections. Uh, that's where we see that most frequently. Uh, and then this is a classic picture here. When you look at that, and immediately what you think is histoplasma. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful about it. You're going to be thinking, well, you know. Uh, Maybe so. There's some other things that it could possibly be. Um, but what we would do with this in the laboratory is we would then take this. Histoplasma is a dimorphic organism. So we would take that and then we would attempt to convert it into a yeast stage. Uh, at this point, we would probably report presumptive histoplasma uh, and then confirm it when it, uh, when it converts into a yeast form. So my point in all of this, you know, I'm not trying to go through a mycology course with you and have you memorize all, all the colony morphology and the, the microscopic morphology of all these different uh, molds. The, the point is to show that this is still, after decades of doing it this way, this is still what we're doing. It's a very manual process. Uh, this is probably the single thing in the entire microbiology laboratory that is most dependent upon the staff's experience and knowledge uh, when it comes to figuring out what these different molds are. Uh, the only other thing that really kind of comes close to comparing to it in that regard would be uh, over in parasites, which is also going to be microscopic identification of organisms. Um, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of that need 
for that experience and knowledge out of bacteriology by making it very easy with the Maldi uh, and very easy to some extent with uh, PCRs. Um, but we have not done that yet with, uh, with molds. Um, now, let me, let me also point out a couple of problems that we have with this too. Um, sometimes you see this. Uh, this is what we would call sterile hyphae. There's nothing going on here. You know, it, it's just all these little filaments all over the place, uh, and we can't get it to do anything. We can't get it to reproduce. Uh, doesn't make any of those spores. Uh, we're kind of stuck there. Um, uh, at that point, there's really nothing that we can do uh, except it's a mold uh, and just let it go. Now, I'll tell you something that we can do a little bit later. Uh, so that is a little harder. Here's what really concerns me about molds. Uh, like I said, moles are all over the place. Moles are common contaminants uh, on our plates. Um, so the, you know, you've got these mole spores that kind of hang around in the air. They're in dust. They're in dirt. Uh, you know, if you got your air conditioner running every now and then, there's some mole spores coming out of there. Makes interpretation very difficult. So if you look, this is the plate here. Uh, is this clinically significant? Let's, what, we can say this is anything. We can say this is a wound infection. We can say this is a, a respiratory, whatever. Uh, there's no question about it. This is certainly clinically significant. This, these colonies, kind of this blue color with the white apron, we already kind of pointed out that could have been an Aspergillus fumigatus. This one happens to be a penicillium, uh, but that's a lot of penicillium to be growing on a, a single plate. So there's no question about it. That is clinically significant, I would feel very confident in reporting that uh, and letting the physician know that this is something that needs to be treated. What about this one? Okay, this one is something that we see fairly frequently. This is a single colony uh, of, a, of a dark, what's called a dematiaceous mold. Um, these single colonies are always very difficult for the laboratory to interpret, okay? One of the things that I would do is look for the streaking pattern. You can't see it in the picture, but if you hold the plate up to the light, you can see where it was streaked. Uh, is this colony on a streak mark or not? Is it in the primary quadrant? Is it off to the side? Um, in other words, did we put it on the plate when we streaked that specimen out, okay? Is this a contaminant from somewhere? Uh, did this get into the plate uh, from the air or from some dust or something while we were streaking the plate? Uh, when we opened up the plate to look at it, if we opened up the plate to look at it, did it kind of land on the plate during that time? Uh, was it contamination during specimen collection? Uh, whenever that specimen was being collected, did it get in from air or dust or something at that point? Or perhaps, was it even in the actual specimen, but not clinically significant? Uh, so you can imagine collecting a sputum, for example. Uh, you may cough up a sputum, but you might have a single mold spore uh, in your mouth at the time. Uh, or, you know, when you spit it out, there's a single mold spore that gets in there. So it's very difficult to look at a single colony like this and say, is this clinically significant or not? For that matter, it could have gotten on here during manufacture of the plate, uh, and it just did not grow until we put it in a nice incubator for it. The reason that this becomes really important uh, is um, antifungals uh, are not really pleasant drugs. You know, uh, we share a little bit of physiology with fungi. We're both eukaryotic organisms. So the antifungal agents tend to be a little bit more toxic to humans. Uh, and since these bugs grow so slowly, um, treatment is long-term. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty hefty ask to say, we need to put somebody on an antifungal agent. Uh, we need to make sure that this is clinically significant here. So at times we decide not to report this. If it's not on a straight line, uh, if it looks like it, if it's off to the side or something like this, uh, we just will say no fungal growth. But it's sometimes we have to do it. Uh, I'll tell you the story that kind of precipitated this for me is just a kid that we have who's, who's still in the hospital right now. 
had a brain specimen sent uh, that grew one colony of Aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, and we in the lab looked at that and thought about it for an hour or two and said, you know, we've got to report it. Uh, it's right in the primary quadrant. We have to report it. Uh, and so now she is on uh, a long course of, of amphotericin B at the moment. Um, so uh, and I may be wrong. She might be on voriconazole now. Um, but I'm like, you know, it was a surprise. The physicians looked at it and said, huh, you know, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But uh, compromised patient, brain infection, one colony of aspergillus, uh, sometimes you get stuck. So it's, it's a good issue for diagnostic stewardship. We really want to say only do these fungal cultures if we have reason to suspect uh, an invasive uh, mole, uh, because you might end up getting treated for one. So are we ever going to bring fungal cultures into the 21st century? Well, we have started to do that. Moldy is available. Uh, Moldy, what do you want to do is you want to start off when the colony is very young, uh, before it starts making all those reproductive structures, just sterile hyphae like that. You go through an extraction process. It's not as easy as what you do with bacteria and put it on your moldy. Here's the good things about it. Early identification. I can see that mold growing. It's just a brand new mold colony. I can put it on the machine and I can have an identification within an hour or so, as opposed to waiting for a week to get appropriate microscopic morphology uh, and then maybe waiting another week to get better microscopic morphology. So the identification may end up coming uh, weeks earlier if you use Maldi. Plus, Maldi is going to get more precise. Uh, you know, our laboratory, um, we, we can't go much beyond uh, the genus level. I mean, with Aspergillus, yes, but with Penicillium, Curvularia, we're not going to take it to the species level. Um, Maldi will be able to do that. The problems with it, it's currently a research use only database. Uh, so the laboratory has got to validate it. That's very difficult to do. Uh, it's kind of a bummer for us. I mean, we want to do it, but it's kind of a bummer because we won't get to look at that cool morphology anymore. We'll have the yeast, the bug, sorry, the fungus, the mole identified before it ever gets any cool morphology. Uh, and so far it just hasn't worked very well for us. Uh, you know, it's probably our problem. Uh, we haven't been able to get it to work very well, but we're still trying on it. And then, of course, the other thing is you got to get to sequencing. Uh, this is ribosomal RNA gene. Uh, all of this is transcribed together and then cut into these individual ribosomal RNA molecules. In between here, you, you've got what's called the internal transcribed spacers. Those are the best thing for identifying moles from a genetic standpoint. So you will amplify those sections, uh, sequence those, and then look up in these big databases, uh, which will give you the identification. Don't worry looking up this thing. You know, if this does not cause disease in humans. This actually uh, infects, uh, I looked it up yesterday, some kind of plant pathogen. Um, but sequencing is, is available. Uh, if you need to go that direction. Uh, a couple of other things about this. Once we got it growing, uh, susceptibility testing for moles. Uh, very few labs do this. There's a couple of reference laboratories. The hot spot of this is uh, University of Texas uh, in San Antonio. Uh, they are kind of like the, the, the gold standard for, for doing this. Uh, they have a laboratory that does nothing but uh, mold identification and susceptibility testing. But very, very few clinical laboratories are going to be involved in that. It's not easy to do. It's very different from bacterial susceptibility testing. Uh, and in many regards, it's really kind of experimental. We really don't know how to do and how to interpret some of these results. The other issue with it is that uh, to a very large extent, the success of treatment really depends upon uh, not so much the... Um, well, I shouldn't say that. The, the success of treatment often depends more heavily on correcting the original compromising situation. Uh, if the problem is that the patient is neutropenic, then the patient is going to do much better 
uh, if you can solve the neutropenia problem, get the neutrophils back up, uh, as opposed to treating with the appropriate uh, antifungal by itself without correcting the compromised situation. Uh, we will calculate uh, during the, the uh, process minimal inhibitory concentrations and what's called minimal effective concentrations. Uh, but those values are often not predictive uh, of whether there's going to be treatment success or not. So for the most part with molds, luckily for most molds, we know what to treat with and that empiric treatment is probably going to be just fine. Uh, we do have some with known resistances. Aspergillus terius is resistant to amphotericin B. We don't need to do susceptibility testing to show that because even if you did susceptibility testing and it tested susceptible to amphotericin B, amphotericin B is not going to work. So we all know not to use amphotericin B for aspergillus terius. We know that echinocandins and some of the azoles do not work when you're talking about a mucorales organism like rhizopus. Uh, susceptibility testing is not going to make any changes there. Now, there are some specific species that tend to show some multi-drug resistances. Uh, so certain species you would look at and say, okay, we, we will probably need to do some susceptibility testing with, with those. So I've talked a little bit about how you really want to kind of know that the patient is at risk for a fungal infection a mold infection before we start ordering fungal cultures. Let me talk specifically about uh, uh, fungal blood cultures. When would a fungal blood culture be appropriate? Uh, and I've shown this before here, and these are all the things you want to kind of look at uh, before ordering a fungal blood culture. What you really want to look at suspicion here is is there suspicion for a disseminated mold infection? Now that could be something like a histoplasma, commonly with a histoplasma, or it could be a, a neutropenic patient, a transplant patient where there's a suspicion uh, for possibly uh, a mucormycosis, aspergillosis, fusariosis, something like that. Um, these are our data over the last year. This is over a 13 month period. We did 118 fungal blood cultures in our laboratory. Only eight of them showed any growth whatsoever. Two of those were overgrown by bacteria, and we couldn't tell whether there was any fungi or not. Um, two had candida that had already grown in regular blood cultures. One had a cryptococcus that had already grown in regular cultures. Uh, three of those, 118, grew histoplasma. Uh, this was in two different patients. But in the one patient who had two fungal blood cultures with histoplasma, uh, they had already had regular blood cultures that had also grown histoplasma. Now, I'll point out that if you suspect histoplasmosis, disseminate histoplasmosis, do a fungal blood culture. Do not rely on a regular blood culture to be able to detect histoplasma. Histoplasma is not going to grow within the five days uh, that we have a regular blood culture on the machine unless it is overwhelming histoplasma infection. And that was the case with this one patient. It was all over the place, so it grew very quickly. Uh, but if you look at that, really what it comes down to is that only one out of those 118 cases uh, did we actually get some information, a positive information, uh, that we didn't already have. Now, I don't want to say that a lot of these were inappropriate because that's kind of, you know, you don't know. Uh, of those 110 that showed no growth, uh, how many of those were appropriate and how many of those were not appropriate? Uh, I mean... Getting a negative culture is still appropriate if you're trying uh, the patient in that risk. But there's some issues there with fungal blood cultures, fungal regular cultures, where we can look at it and say, okay, is, is this an opportunity to kind of cut back so that we don't get those false hits, those contaminated hits that can lead to long-term antifungal treatment? I do want to point out in the last, oh, well, I'm a, at the very last bit here, uh, about some non-cultural methods, uh, because these, uh, in my opinion, are, are kind of used inappropriately, uh, at least around here. The antigen test, galactamanin and the beta deglucan, these are polysaccharides that are produced by molds and are released as they are actively growing. Uh, so you're going to see these in the bloodstream when you have uh, some invasive mold infection at some point in the body. Uh, that is, is growing and releasing these polysaccharides. They are not organism-specific. A lot of people will say that 
Galactomannan is specific to Aspergillus. It is not. Uh, you will get a positive hit for Galactomannan, um, you know, if you have a penicillium or fusarium infection. It will happen. The way these tests are intended to be used is I've got a patient who is at risk for invasive fungal disease. They are neutropenic. They've had a transplant. They're on chemotherapy. Uh, they have no neutrophils whatsoever. They're at risk for invasive fungal disease. So I'm going to do this test once a week, twice a week, and watch for a positive because that will come up positive before there are any symptoms of fungal disease, before there's any radiologic evidence of fungal disease. A lot of times the way these get used is here is a patient, they may have a fungal disease. We're thinking, oh, you, you have symptoms here. We think you may have a fungal disease. And they do the galactomannan as a way of showing, yes, it's a fungal disease. That's not really the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, there are some notable false positives and there are some notable negatives that do have to be kept in mind. Uh, the other possibility that's out there is PCR. PCR is, of course, organism specific. You are doing a PCR for aspergillus. Uh, this is a little different because DNA is only going to be released from the organism as it's dying, not as it's growing, as it's dying. Uh, so PCR tends to actually be a little bit less sensitive than the galactomannan is uh, in the case of an active infection. So unfortunately, only a small group of common molds are going to have this really available. And like we said, you know, you can do the sequencing now. Broad spectrum primers can allow for fungal sequencing of uh, lots of different molds. So I ran through that really quickly there. I, I'm sorry for kind of barging through at the end there. But my, my issue there is that this is a very manual process as far as uh, culture goes. Um, it's difficult to interpret sometimes. Uh, and these non-cultural methods are, are certainly something to kind of keep in your back pocket and use those as necessary. This is just a cool picture, probably completely fake, of a penicillium species. So that was my quick run through of molds. Uh, mm -hmm. I will be happy to entertain any questions if anybody's got any. Any questions for Dr. Junkins? I do enjoy the pictures of, of the molds there. They're very pretty. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons for doing a presentation on moles, because they're cooler looking than bacteria are. Yes, yes, they are pretty cool. All right. Well, if there are no questions, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Junkins, for presenting for us. And our next um, Grand Rounds will be on April the 10th, um, where Thomas Chandler will present about community acquired pneumonia and the immune compromised host. Thank you.